Today, we'd like to look at capacitors as particle accelerators. This is going to be a really important component for many high-tech devices in the scientific and the medical field. Okay, so a couple examples before we get into how these actually work. The first one is an X-ray machine. We are going to accelerate electrons, hit a target, and when the electrons hit that target, they're going to produce light of very high frequency, gamma rays or X-rays. Okay, so one example of where we use these particle accelerators is to create X-rays by accelerating electrons. We have these things that are known as cathode ray tubes. These are the old TV sets that you might have seen. These are particle accelerators where we accelerate electrons through a magnetic field and hit the screen in such a way as to paint a picture. We will learn more about these later. The part we want to look at now is this particle accelerator part that starts the whole process working. And then another very important device, it's called the mass spectrometer. And we're going to be looking at this part right here. Later, we'll be learning about the other parts, but this is the part where we accelerate our unknown material so we can figure out what that material actually is. Okay, so we start by ionizing some stuff, and then we're going to use our, par our capacitors to accelerate our particles. And later, we're going to use magnetic fields and electric fields to split these materials up so we can figure out what they are actually made of. So again, we're only looking at the accelerator parts for these three devices. X-ray machines, cathode ray tubes, and mass spectrometers. There are many other examples of particle accelerators using capacitors, but these are three that I think you've probably heard of before. Before we get started, I wanna make sure you understand our formulas we're going to be using. So here are all our electricity formulas. And for this stuff, we are going to be restricted to the connecting formulas. The force on our charge depends on the electric field and the amount of charge that we are putting in the electric field. We are going to be using this one where we look at the voltage between the two plates of our capacitor. That will let us predict our electric field if we know how far the plates are apart. We'll go back to one that we used last year, our change in energy or work. Note that this is energy and this E is electric field. Don't get them confused. Anyway, the change in energy is equal to the force on the particle times how far the particle moves. Finally, we'll be using this formula. Again, one of our connectors. The change of the potential energy of our charge is equal to our charge times the amount of voltage or potential difference that we had our charge move through. So a quick example, I have a capacitor or two metal plates separated by an insulator. Most times when we're doing a particle accelerator, our insulator is going to be air or better yet, a vacuum, or at least very close to a vacuum. So there is nothing in the particles way. Okay, so anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to charge up one of the plates negative. We're going to charge up the other plate positive, And we're going to have a little light object placed between them. What's going to happen is this object, since it's neutral, will be attracted to the negative plate. It'll pick up a charge and become negative. It'll then be repelled by the negative plate and attracted to the positive plate. This particle, this little black thing that looks like a marshmallow, is going to be accelerated by the charges on this capacitor. When it hits this plate, it's going to give up its negative charges and become neutral and then be attracted back to the negative. That is not how we are normally going to work with particle accelerators. Most time, there's going to be a hole in this second plate 
so that the particles shoot right out the hole and become projectiles that we can then analyze and use. One of the places you're, where you're gonna see this is in a device called an oscilloscope. So here's an oscilloscope being used to look at a signal that's going into a speaker. And you can see the pattern up on the oscilloscope. We will soon find out how this pattern is generated using our capacitors and our particle accelerators. But for now, let's just take a look at it. You can see how when I change the electrical signal, the sign curve on the oscilloscope changes. And this is all done by capacitors. The one we're going to be looking at today is the accelerating capacitor, where we're going to take an electron, we're going to make this plate negative, we're going to play, make the plate with the hole positive, we're going to have the electron get repelled from the negative plate, attracted to the positive plate, and it's going to shoot right through the vacuum tube that is part of the system. It's going to hit this screen, and the spot where it hits the screen is going to glow. Right now, we're going to ignore this capacitor, which is going to be the deflecting capacitor, and that'll be used later when we see how to deflect our charges with our capacitor. So right now, there's no deflection, so the electrons are all hitting at the very center of the oscilloscope. So again, without wasting any more time, let's see how we actually work with the mathematics of these particle accelerators. All right, the two things you need to know to start out, actually three, you need to know the charge of your particle that you're accelerating. In this case, it's an electron, so we can just look up the charge of the electron on our reference sheet. Sometimes these will be ions, and you have to know, are they plus one? Are they a plus two? Are they a minus three? And remember, minus three just means it is three times the charge of an electron. You also need to know how far, how far apart the plates of your capacitor are, and you have to know how many volts are connected to your plates of your capacitor. So in this case, there is a difference of 2,000 volts between the two plates. These are the four formulas for electricity that we talked about a minute ago that would be used with our capacitor. So again, we are going to know the delta x, the distance between our plates. We're going to know the voltage difference between our two plates. And we are going to try to find all the other things. Mainly at the end, we're going to try and figure out how fast this electron is going to be moving. And we're going to try and figure out how much time it took to accelerate from one plate to the other. So just as a quick reminder, this formula tells you the change in energy. This is joules. This will be how much force is on the charged particle. And this will be the delta x. This will be the change in energy of our little particle. This is the charge of our little particle. And this is how much voltage there is between the plates. Another formula that we might use, this, be careful, is electric field. This is in Newtons per Coulomb. This will be the charge. And this will be how much force the charge feels when it's between those plates. Finally, the change in voltage, electric field again, distance between the plates. All right, so don't get confused between the change in energy and electric field. That's why oftentimes W will be used for change in energy, and we call that work. Okay, so again, here's an example. We have our plates charged up using some sort of power source. We want to know, we need to know the voltage. We need to know how far apart the plates are. You measure from the inside to the inside, not center to center. You need to know the charge that you are accelerating. We're going to try and figure out the time it takes to transverse this distance. And we're going to try and figure out the speed when it gets to the other plate. 
Again, we're going to try and have a hole in the other plate so it shoots right out of the plate and then we can use it. All right, so why don't you draw this out? We'll try to accelerate an electron using 100 volts with a gap of 15 centimeters. Again, you'll see a small hole in the positive plate so the electron can fire right through that hole. There are three different ways you can come up with your final answer. You should know all of them because sometimes there's an advantage to using one of these methods versus the other. So the first one is using fields. You'll start with the voltage and the distance. Make sure you plug this in in meters. Make sure this gets plugged in as volts. And you're going to solve for electric field. That'll tell you how strong the electric field is between the plates. Once you have that electric field, you plug it in here. You plug in whatever charge you're accelerating. In this case, it's the charge of an electron. So you can look up the number of coulombs on your reference sheet. And you solve for the force on the charge in newtons. Then you go back to what we learned last year. And you're going to do Newton's second law, where you take your net force, which would be this electric force. You plug in the mass. So in this case, it's the mass of the electron. Sometimes it'll be the mass of ions or protons or whatever exotic thing we're trying to accelerate. And then we get the acceleration of our particle. We can then plug it into any of our kinematic equations that we learned last year. And we can have usually an initial velocity of zero. And we could use this to figure out how much time it takes the particle to transverse these plates. We can also find the final velocity. So these are usually the two things that we want, the final velocity or the time. You could use any of the equations based on what you have and what you're trying to determine. If you want to do it using energy, you start with this formula. Again, you have the charge, in this case, the charge of an electron. You have your voltage, which in this case, the difference in voltage is 100 volts. And you find your energy in joules. You can then plug that change in energy in for your work or delta E, and you could solve for the force. You could then plug it in and get your acceleration, and you could solve for the things we did before, time and final velocity. You should get the same exact answers with this method that you got with the first method. Again, it's personal preference which way you're going to attack it or based on what you know. Finally, the easiest is the kinetic energy solution. And with that one, you're going to start with the same formula we did last time, but you're then just going to take that change in potential energy, you're going to plug it in the kinetic, and you're going to find the final velocity of your charge. The disadvantage to this method is you cannot find the time it took the electron to get from one plate to the other. There are many times where that is not important, and this method is best. If you do need to find the time, use one of the other two methods that we just looked at. Anyway, I know this was a lot to take in. We'll be practicing some of this tomorrow, and hopefully the more you do it, the easier these concepts will become.